Welcome back to the DoD Risk Management Framework video series. I'm Mike Redman here to help you work your way through implementing the NIST Risk Management Framework. In this section, we're going to take a look at risk analysis processes and decide on effective risk management options for your information system. For those of you studying for the ISC squared cap examination, remember, study the stages of the traditional CNA model and the risk management framework. Be sure to take note of how the two models match up. Study the key documents produced in the risk management framework and study the key concept of authorization decisions. As we start to look at the risk management processes, it starts with a little bit of background, starting with the ICD-503, signed by the Director of National Intelligence and effective as of September 15, 2008. It rescinded the DCID-63 policy and manual and the DCID-65 manual. It also requires intelligent community elements to determine the level of risk based on the overall effect to the mission not just the checklist. It addresses policy for the following, risk management, certification, accreditation, reciprocity and interconnections, and governance and dispute resolution. As for the authorities, the ICD-503 is authorized by the National Security Act of 1947, the Federal Information Security Management Act, or FISMA, of 2002, and the amended EO-12958 and EO-12333. So as we begin to look at the risk management process, let's first lay down a definition. Risk management is the process that allows IT managers to balance the operational and economic costs of effective measures and achieve gains in mission capability by protecting the IT systems and data that support their organization's missions. Its overall objective is to achieve acceptable levels of information security well-informed decisions and justifications, and assessing and authorizing decisions. The risk management framework takes a three-tiered model towards integrated organization-wide risk management. You can see this laid out in more detail in NIST Special Publication 839. Starting with Tier 1, the organization. This is where the specific techniques and methodologies for risk management is managed. Tier 1 manages the methods and procedures as well as mitigating measures. Tier 1 also sets the overall risk tolerance for the organization and ensures ongoing continuous monitoring. Tier 2 is for mission and business processes. Defining the core missions and business processes happens at Tier 2, the information and information flow. Prioritizing missions and business processes, defining the types of information needed, as well as incorporating high-level information security into missions and those business processes. And finally, Tier 3, the information system. This is where you will handle the specific allocation of security controls, whether they are system-specific, hybrid, or common. The risk assessment process is composed of four primary steps. Step 1, prepare for the assessment. Step 2, conduct the assessment. Step 3, communicate and share assessment results. And step 4, maintain the assessment. Starting with step one, first we need to identify the overall purpose. This begins to set the expectation of the information that the assessment is intended to produce and any decisions the assessment is intended to support. Then we identify the overall scope. What is the organizational applicability, uh, the time frame supported, and the architecture and technology considerations happen within the first step of identifying the scope. Next, identify any assumptions or constraints. 
The organization's risk tolerance should be well-defined and communicated, and also any priorities or trade-offs that might have to occur. Then identify information sources, being sure to be descriptive with the different threats, vulnerabilities, and potential impacts against the information system. Next, identify the risk model and analytic approach. There may be one or more risk models in use in conducting a risk assessment. Identify which models is to be used for the risk assessment and stick to it. That brings us to step two. First, identify the threat sources. It's important to identify and characterize all possible threat sources of concern for the information system, and then identify the capability, intent, and targeting characteristics for adversarial threats against that system and the range of effects for non-adversarial effects. Next, identify threat events. What is a potential threat event? What is a relevant threat event? What are the threat sources that could initiate an event? Next, identify vulnerabilities and predisposing conditions. This will be set by the organization itself, the mission and business processes, and the information system. This should be identified throughout the organization itself, the specific mission and business processes of the system, as well as the information system itself. Next, determine the likelihood, the characteristics of the specific threat sources. What are the vulnerability conditions identified against the information system? What is the organizational susceptibility reflecting the safeguards and countermeasures planned or implemented to impede these events? To determine the likelihood, we use the 830. This is the guide for conducting risk assessments. You'll see that you have four choices, very low, low, moderate, high, and very high. For each risk or th for each person, you must identify what is the likelihood of that threat event against the likelihood that the threat event is going to have an adverse impact. To determine your overall impact, you need to identify the characteristics of the threat sources themselves, identify the vulnerability conditions that have been identified, and the organizational susceptibility to reflecting the safeguards and countermeasures planned or implemented to impede such events. Now, when it comes to determining overall impact, this is where quantifying meets qualifying. We call it semi-qualitative values. You'll also find this in the NIST 830. For very high events, expected to have multiple severe or catastrophic effects, we would score this as a 10. For very low events, expected to have negligible effects, we would score this as a zero and so forth. When determining risk, what we're looking at is the impact that would result from the event, the likelihood of the event itself occurring. And next, we communicate the risk assessment results. It doesn't do us any good to do all the assessment work and keep it to ourselves. This is where we will present the total risk assessment, or at least the preliminary risk assessment, to the organizational decision makers so they can begin to identify support risk responses. Next, it's important to share the risk-related results. This is where the executive risk function comes in. Again, this is made up of the organizational decision makers that support the risk responses and the security subject matter experts across all disciplines. And then step four, monitor for the risk factors. What are the organizational operations and assets? Ensuring to monitor the individuals, other organizations that might impact the system, as well as impact the nation as a whole. And finally, to update the risk assessment. Any identified risk is just another condition that must be addressed. This is where a solid, cohesive risk management team is important. Risk presents itself throughout the 
system's entire life cycle. They aren't one-off, two-off events. This is why all team members must be well-tuned to the system. Upon receiving the assessment results, there is a determination to be made. Uh, risk acceptance, risk avoidance, risk mitigation, risk sharing or transfer, or a combination of any of the above. So now that we've laid out the four primary steps, let's look at how it fits together across all components. Remember that NIST, in partnership with the DoD itself, the intelligence communities, and CNSS, has developed a common information security framework for all federal government and contractors. The overall goal is to improve information security, strengthen risk management processes, and encourage reciprocity among all federal agencies. Uh, this is well defined and laid out for you in the NIST 837 that transforms the classic CNA into a well defined six step risk management framework. Again, looking at these six core steps of the risk management framework is categorize, select, implement, assess, authorize, and monitor. So how does the traditional CNA and the risk management framework line up together? You can see it laid out here. For instance, the traditional CNA process, you'd have task one, preparation. Uh, this is where the information system description would be identified, the security categorization, and so forth. Well, we're still doing that in step one of the risk management framework. We identify the system description, we categorize the system, and we register the system. You may be using Archer or EMAS or whatever your component is using. Also identified are the common control identifications, the security control selections, the security control implementations, and the security control documentation. Now, in step two of the traditional CNA, you would have notification, uh, simple planning and resourcing, followed by the SSP analytics update and acceptance. Uh, this is where you would do the security configuration review, uh, the security planning analysis, and the system security plan update. Uh, again, this is still happening within the framework. We call it the system plan approval. This is where we begin with our monitoring strategy for the system. That moves us to step four of the traditional CNA, the security control assessment itself, and then the security control confirmation documentation. Well, obviously we're still doing that within the risk management framework. The assessment happens, the plan of action and milestones is created, and the documentation is prepared. So really, you see, when you break it down to its core processes, there's not a lot of difference between, for instance, DICAP and the risk management framework. It's not a different process, it's just different wording. All the same requirements were there under one that are there now. So, what are the key documents that you will need for an RMF authorization? Uh, it would be the system security plan itself, uh, the plan of action and milestones, or the POAM, the security assessment report, the SAR, and the authorization decision document, or the ADD. Now, that is the core, what we used to call executive package to a risk management framework authorization package. However, to create all of these, especially the SSP, you need all supporting artifacts, all supporting policies, standards, and procedures from across the organization so the controls can be properly assessed. In the next section, we're gonna jump into step one, categorization.